In previous discussions, we have studied optimization techniques in great detail. In today's case study, we shall see how to apply those concepts to design powerful solvers for the CSVM problem for binary classification. Note that we will hide the bias term inside the model vector by appending a 1 at the end of the feature vectors. Doing so will simplify our algorithms. Before proceeding with today's discussion, it might be helpful if you could refresh your concepts of descent-based and constrained optimization. Click on the links above to revisit those discussions. My wonderful friends, this is CS771, Introduction to Machine Learning, and let's get started. Recall that the CSVM formulation is designed to learn a linear model for a binary classification problem. Here is the optimization problem with n training points and d dimensional features. Today, we will see how to solve this problem in the dual. Since the hinge loss form of the problem does not have any constraints, we need to introduce some in order to proceed with the dual creation process. Fortunately, in this case, we already know of another form of the CSVM problem that does have constraints. For sake of simplicity, we have converted all constraints to less than equal to constraints. There is no more processing to be done, so we can just go ahead and introduce dual variables for the two n constraints that we have. Notice that all of these two n dual variables will themselves be constrained to be non-negative. Next, we can go ahead and create the Lagrangian which takes four inputs, which are all vector variables. These are two primal variables w and psi and two dual variables alpha and beta. Let us now simplify this dual. To minimize with respect to w, setting the partial derivatives of the Lagrangian to zero with respect to w gives us an expression or formula for the model w in terms of alpha and the training features and labels. Specifically, we see that w is equal to the summation of alpha i times y i times x i. Take a moment to memorize this expression. It will come in handy later. This expression will allow us to recover the optimal value of w once we have obtained the optimal value of alpha by solving the dual problem. Minimizing the Lagrangian with respect to the second primal variable, that is xi, requires a bit more care. Notice that the Lagrangian is a linear function of xi, since the only term that contains xi looks like xi i transpose the vector c times the all ones vector minus alpha minus beta. As we have seen before, Unless this linear term is identically zero everywhere, minimizing with respect to xi will yield a negatively infinite value, which is useless since the dual problem seeks to maximize the q function with respect to the dual variables. Thus, at the optimum, we must have alpha plus beta equals the all c vector. Substituting the expression for w into the Lagrangian and using the fact that the linear term involving xi is zero allows us to simplify the dual. Note that we have an additional constraint, namely that alpha plus beta must equal the all c vector. At this point, we also notice that the dual variable beta does not seem to participate in the objective at all. This means that we should try to eliminate this variable, and indeed, we can do this by setting beta i equals to c minus alpha i. However, remember that we also need to eliminate the constraint on beta i which now gives us a new constraint, that is, alpha i must be less than or equal to c. This greatly cleans up the dual, which can now be written as a minimization problem over the vector alpha, where each coordinate of alpha is constrained to be between 0 and c. We will now see several techniques to solve the simplified dual problem. The first method we will consider is projected gradient descent, since we have constraints in the dual problem. To make the gradient calculation simpler, we will adopt a slightly different matrix notation. Let us create this n cross d matrix Z, each of whose rows is the feature vector of a training point multiplied with the corresponding label. With this notation, if we do the computations carefully, then we can get hold of the gradient of the objective with respect to alpha in order n d time, where n is the number of data points and d is the dimensionality of the model. Note that if we are not careful with the order in which the calculations are done, we may end up spending much, much more time computing the exact same gradient. Nevertheless, we are now able to take the descent step in order n time. 
Projecting back onto the feasible step after the descent step can also be done in order n time since we only have box constraints. Revisit our discussion on projected gradient descent to refresh these projection algorithms. Thus, a single projected gradient descent step can be done in order n d time. If this seems too expensive to you, not to worry. We have already studied several ways to speed up the process. We know that gradient descent can be sped up by using an approximation to the gradient that is much faster to compute. The stochastic gradient method is one way to do this. We will now see a way to compute a stochastic gradient for the CSVM dual objective. If we pay close attention to the gradient calculations, we notice that we need order nd time to compute the gradient simply because we decided to use all d columns of the z matrix to compute the gradient. If instead we use just one randomly chosen column of the z matrix in each iteration, then we get a stochastic gradient that can be computed in just order n time. Since the descent step and the projection step are already possible in order n time, this means that we can do a projected SGD step with the dual problem in just order n time. Certain details of the stochastic gradient calculation will make more sense to you once we have covered the basics of probability and statistics. For now, let's get back to the problem. Can we get even faster steps? For example, it is common for d to be smaller than n. Wouldn't it be super awesome if we could get a descent step done in just order d time? It turns out that this is indeed possible by using coordinate minimization. Recall that in this technique, we choose one coordinate in every iteration and minimize the objective completely with respect to that coordinate, keeping all other coordinates fixed. We will need to be more careful while applying coordinate minimization here since we have constraints as well. Let us fix some coordinate i of the alpha vector o which we wish to minimize. Take some time to do the calculations yourself to find out all the terms in the objective that depend on alpha i. Also find out all the constraints that depend on alpha i. A little bit of cleanup and defining two new real variables u and v to simplify the notation tells us that the minimization problem with respect to alpha i is extremely simple. It is just a one-dimensional quadratic minimization problem within interval constraints, which can be solved very easily using Melbo's favorite quintric that we saw in the previous discussion. Note that the terms u and v here are effectively constants since in coordinate descent, the coordinates apart from the chosen one are all treated as constants. So, are we done? Have we gotten our order d descent step? Not just yet. If we look closely, we realize that to apply the quint trick, we first need to calculate u and v. The problem is that the value of v will keep changing from iteration to iteration since the alpha vector keeps changing and computing v from scratch each time will itself take order n d time, dashing all hopes of an order d algorithm. To get around this, we need to do some careful bookkeeping. Let us see what this means. To speed up the coordinate minimization method, we need a way to get hold of the u and v values really fast. Doing this with the u value is simpler. Notice that this value is simply the squared Euclidean norm of the ith data point where i was the coordinate of the alpha vector we are updating. Since these values do not change during the coordinate minimization steps, we can effectively pre-compute them and store them in an n-dimensional vector, say r. During a coordinate minimization iteration, we can then simply read off the value of u in a single step. Speeding up the computation of v will take more care. Note that the time-consuming part in computing v is the summation that runs over all indices j except the index i which we are updating. If we use linearity of the dot product and complete the summation to run over all indices including i, we find that v can indeed be computed in order d time. However, to do so, we need to define a bookkeeping variable z, which will always store the value of summation over all indices j, alpha j times yj times xj. Note that z is a d-dimensional vector, which will itself need to be updated whenever any alpha coordinate gets updated. Fortunately, updating z takes only order d time once we update an alpha i value, which means that using this bookkeeping technique, we can execute the entire coordinate minimization step in just order d time. Notice another advantage of maintaining this bookkeeping variable z. When we are done solving the dual and have a reasonably optimal value of the dual variable alpha, z itself will be the optimal value of the model w. 
To see why, recall that at the optimum, the model W must be equal to the summation over all indices i, alpha i times yi times xi. Here is an outline of the stochastic dual coordinate minimization algorithm. Given our data points, we first initialize our alpha values and calculate the corresponding value of the bookkeeping variable z. We see that initializing all alpha values to zero is very convenient since then we don't have to do any computations to find z since it is also the zero vector. We also do pre-computations to save time later. Now we start the coordinate minimization iterations. In each iteration, we choose a coordinate i of the alpha vector to update. We can choose this coordinate randomly, cyclically or using the random permutation technique we have seen in previous discussions. Then we get hold of the u and v values and use the quint trick to get the optimal value of alpha i. The values of the other coordinates of the alpha vector are not changed. Next, we make sure that we update the z vector as well. Note that this just involves the addition of two d-dimensional vectors that can be done in order d time. Thus, we see that each iteration of the coordinate minimization algorithm can be completed in just order d time. Finally, when we are done, we return the latest value of the z vector since that is assured to be the optimal value of the model vector. Due to its speed, the stochastic dual coordinate minimization algorithm is quite popularly used even in professional machine learning libraries such as scikit-learn. To practice your skills at designing algorithms using bookkeeping and pre-computation tricks, try to design a coordinate descent algorithm that solves the CSVM in the primal. In each iteration, you would choose some coordinate of the model vector w and take a partial subgradient step along that coordinate. Try to use bookkeeping tricks and pre-computation to make sure that you are able to do this in no more than order n time. Here's a hint of what you might find helpful as a bookkeeping variable. Having explored so many solvers for the CSVM problem, both in the primal and dual, let us take a step back to see the big picture. Here is a table that summarizes how long each descent step takes if we are optimizing the CSVM in its primal form or in its dual form. The columns correspond to various algorithms that could have been used to solve these forms. We note that simple gradient descent or subgradient descent takes order nd time per step no matter whether we are solving the primal or the dual. However, Interesting patterns emerge when we use stochastic gradient descent or coordinate descent or coordinate minimization. SGD takes order d time in the primal but order n time in the dual. With the coordinate techniques, the pattern is flipped. Coordinate descent takes order n time in the primal and order d time in the dual. This can influence our choice of solver. If we have more data points and dimensions, then primal SGD or dual coordinate minimization are preferable. However, if we have more dimensions than data points, then primal coordinate descent or dual SGD are preferable. Of course, remember that this is just the per step cost of various algorithms. The number of steps we need to take itself may vary across algorithms. To get some more practice on designing solvers, design a coordinate descent solver for the primal form of the ridge regression problem. Use bookkeeping and pre-computations to ensure that each descent step takes no more than order n time. And modify the algorithm to a coordinate minimization algorithm where instead of taking just a descent step, we completely optimize the objective with respect to the chosen coordinate of the model W. Ensure that each coordinate minimization step takes no more than order n time. Before wrapping up this discussion, let us summarize what we have studied today. Today, we derived a simplified form of the Lagrangian dual of the CSVM problem. We then looked at three solvers for the dual problem with different per step time complexities. While doing so, we learnt about the useful techniques of bookkeeping and pre-computations which could greatly speed up the implementation of these solvers. Finally, we observed that the per step or iteration complexity of various algorithms can greatly depend on the number of data points as well as the model dimensionality. So this is a good point to stop, stay curious and I will see you next time.